Welcome to my channel on the best of fantasy. Today I am reviewing Valor. This is book two of The Faithful and the Fallen. That is a four-part series by John Gwynn. Now, there might be some spoilers in this video for Malice. That is book one of the series, and I already did a review on that. I will put a link to it in the description below. Also, I had a wonderful discussion with some fellow booktubers about Malice that appeared on my channel. I'll also link that. And recently, I was in a discussion with those same booktubers uh, about Valor. And that video appeared on the channel the Library of Alexandria. So I was talking about Valor with Alan and Abby Salter and Patrick Leo and also Alex Nieves joined us. So lots of fun. If you haven't seen it yet, check out that video on Alan's channel. I will put a link in the description below. The pacing of Valor is actually even faster than that of Malice, which I thought was pretty fast. And there's just nonstop action battle sequences, chases, kidnappings, and dynastic plottings and betrayals in the style of A Song of Ice and Fire, though without the same level of description, the detailed description that you would find uh, as a hallmark of George Martin's work. And as uh, Patrick pointed out in our group discussion of Valor, this book builds on the character work that was done in Malice very nicely. And it depends on it in some way. So you really feel attachment to the characters as they fly through this whirlwind of events. The prose is, as I've mentioned before, very accessible and straightforward, making The Faithful and the Fallen a series that I've already started recommending to people who are interested in giving fantasy a try, or to experienced fantasy readers who just want a, maybe a break from some of the weightier series out there. And even though these books are fast-paced and entertaining, there are a lot of tragic things that happen in the course of them so far. And perhaps because there isn't much time for mourning the, in this really action-oriented plot, it's, it's more poignant when the mourning does happen. And some of my, actually my favorite parts are the few quiet moments of reflection on the losses that the characters have experienced. And in the band of characters that is formed around Idana and Corbin, there are some genuine ties that have only strengthened through the trauma and the dangers they've endured. And they show some, um, I think numerous times they show that they are willing to sacrifice for one another. Another thing I really enjoy about this series so far would be the nods to ancient Celtic lore and historical influences. In my review of Malice, I discussed the Roman inspiration in the Kingdom of Tenebral with their phalanx style of battle, among other things. I also mentioned the obvious Celtic sources, most especially the Welsh flavor to the names and the, uh, also the cultures in the Banished Lands. In Valor, this certainly continues, this Celtic influence, but I would say that the Irish influence becomes a little more prominent in Valor. In addition to the fact that the giants in the story speak Irish, one kingdom that gets more attention in Valor and is very obviously Irish in inspiration is Don. And I'm going to say Don because I believe that's close. I, forgive me, I'm not actually um, an Irish speaker, um, but I believe that when you have an H in the middle of a word, it cancels out the consonant before it. Um, so it's spelled D-O-M-H-A-I-N, but I believe the correct pronunciation, in Irish at least, is Don or something like that. Uh, so I'll go with that. Anyway, um, the, the word actually means something too. I believe it means something like the world or uh, it has several different meanings, but that's one of them perhaps. Anyway, this is a kingdom that uh, Halion meant to find refuge in for Idana and the rest of their company when they were escaping from Ardan in, in his, Halion's native kingdom. Also Connell's, of course, Connell's gone somewhere else. And uh, also when they're feasting, I'm pretty sure that they're drinking some kind of stout <laughs> in Doan, which is tastier than the mead that you would get in Ardan. And it's also a contrast to the wine that they might be drinking in Tenebral. 
Speaking of the giants speaking Irish, there are several nods to Irish mythology among that ancient race in the banished lands. One would be the queen of the Benothi, uh, the uh, woman named Nemain, whose name actually comes from a trio of goddesses that make up the Morrigan, the war goddess of Irish mythology. And another one would be Baylor One-Eye. This is also an ancient name of a giant, in fact, um, a, one of the Fomorians, an ancient race that inhabited Ireland before the people came along. And these were giants who were rivals to the gods, the Tua de Danan, much in the same way that the Norse giants are rivals to the uh, gods of Norse mythology. Now, it isn't necessary to know all about these ancient tales in order to enjoy the faithful and the fallen, obviously, but it is one of my favorite aspects of the series that John Gwynn has given all these wonderful nods to these old stories. And anyone with interest in these ancient stories should check out the Welsh Mabinogion and the Irish material, which, according to my understanding, falls under four categories. The, there are the invasion myths, the ones that uh, mention those Fomorians, and then there's the Ulster Cycle, which is perhaps the most famous and includes the character Cuchulain, and there's also the Fenian Cycle, which centers around uh, the King Finn, and there are various tales of the historical cycle as well. So, personally, I just love fantasy that has roots in ancient lore. It's an impulse that we see with a lot of authors, such as Tolkien, with his reflections of Old English language and culture among the Rohirrim or the Erlingas, uh, though it may be more common in modern fantasy, that's my impression anyway, uh, for authors to entirely make up cultures. Still, there are those who continue to, to do this sort of thing, like uh, RF Kuang in the Poppy War, using the uh, shamanism, that's the book I'm reading right now, so that popped in my head. Um, and I also find that grounding fantasy and, and uh, fantasy worlds in ancient tales can add depth um, and an arresting aura and a level of believability that uh, adds to the story. Plus, like a lot of people, I enjoy finding, I guess, kind of Easter eggs or these nods to something older. Gwyn does a fantastic job of including some of these fun nods to Gaelic and Brythonic Celtic culture, as well as the Romans. It's one of the reasons that The Faithful and the Fallen feels like classical fantasy to me, along with the integration of some familiar tropes and an overall showdown between good and evil. But that fast pace feels very modern, with chapters that are fairly short and switch perspectives. It's just got a relentless, really well done pace that keeps the reader's interest. That showdown between good and evil that I mentioned gets some of its atmosphere from yet another important source for the faithful and the fallen, and that would be Paradise Lost, which in turn is inspired by the book of Genesis from the Bible. Now, there are the, the Ben Elim, this is the most probably direct example, and this is actually an angelic order whose name comes from Hebrew, and I believe it means something like sons of God, uh, something of that nature. Um, but at any rate, um, it is definitely a reference to an angelic order, one of the many angelic orders in Hebrew. And their rivalry with the Kadashim in The Faithful and the Fallen feels a lot like the battle between God's angels and those who follow Satan, who is clearly Azroth in The Faithful and the Fallen. But no matter what its roots, what any modern fantasy needs is some convincing characters. Malice and Valor, maybe they don't feature, you know, characters with Robin Hobb type level of psychological development, but, you know, that would be impossible uh, to have that along with the breakneck pace of these books. However, I will say that Gwyn has most definitely succeeded in creating characters that I care about. In Corbin, for example, we have a protagonist who is uh, clearly derivative of the farm boy to chosen one trope. Not a farm boy in this case, I believe he's, yeah, he's a blacksmith's son. Um, but Corbin has his own personality and his relationship with Storm. While it's not original in fantasy, the boy and his dog kind of thing, it's really well done and it makes him highly sympathetic. He's also an interesting contrast to Nathair, who embraces his 
chosen one status a bit too enthusiastically. Nathair is essentially a dupe, but that makes him a more interesting villain, if you will, uh, because he clearly believes he's on the side of good and justice. Many of the other characters are interesting because of their inner conflict. There is Veritas, for example, so faithful to Nathair, but he has to keep telling himself that what he's doing is for the greater good, especially as he interacts with Cohen. And I'm going to say Cohen, even though many of you might say Cywin. Um, whatever you say, he's a great character. More alone than the other characters, Cywin's arc is a lesson in perseverance and hope. Another character who develops in an interesting manner to me is Camlin. He's actually one of my favorites, and uh, I love how he debates his newfound loyalties and becomes something of a father figure in here, perhaps to his surprise as he discovers some of his own goodness. Perhaps the most compelling arc in Valor for me, though, is Mackens, who is, you know, he's thrust into some intense situations. I just found myself really looking forward to his chapters in this book. And, you know, he has to make some heart-wrenching decisions. Talk about conflict. I also really continue to love some of the characters with slightly smaller roles, such as Brina. She's a favorite of mine. And some of the more mysterious characters, like Gar, they become a bit more fleshed out in some interesting ways. This great cast of characters is a big part of the entertainment uh, so far for me in The Faithful and The Fallen, and I find myself invested in what is going to happen to them next in Ruin. I hear that I might need a handkerchief or a box of tissues handy when I'm reading this third installment of The Faithful and The Fallen, which I am very much looking forward to. And my next review, however, will be on the third book of the Poppy War trilogy. I mentioned before, I am reading The Burning God, and so far I'm actually really enjoying it. So I will be talking to you soon about that, and I hope you will join me for that review. Until next time.